Welcome to The Read Along. A mini book club for your ears. I'm your host, Scott. I'm your other host, Anita. And join us on a journey through a good book, one one chapter chapter at a time. time. Do you like talking about movies? Do you like talking about mediocre movies? Do you like talking about how you could have fixed mediocre movies? Well, I certainly do, and you can listen to me, Scott C. Bourgeois, along with my co-hosts Greg Beaver and Liam Kreswick, as we give our notes, and I have some notes. You can follow it now on your podcatcher of choice, or support it by visiting patreon.com slash I have some notes. So when this episode comes out, Christmas will be done. Uh, yes. We'll have done all of the running around and seen all the family and... Eaten all of the things. And uh, kept the kids, hopefully, relatively preoccupied for a week at With home. With presents. Yeah, and stuff and activities. Yeah. No snow. No. Makes it's, me sad. It's not going to be a, a terribly white Christmas for us this year. No. Our forecast does not include a lot of precipitation. No, it's been... Of any kind. Famously, we talk about the weather a lot. Um, (laughs) And it's been uh, a while since we have, but we've had an incredibly mild winter so far. I realize that winter only technically just started, but like winter... calendar-wise, but... Yeah. Like usually by November, we're into snow where we live. Um, It gets usually pretty deep by December or January. Um, we have very little snow on the ground. It's I, I, gross. I less than an inch. Yeah, there's only part of our yard has snow in it because the temperatures have also been hovering above freezing for most of the month, which yeah. is unseasonal and very strange. It's either just above or just below, like within a few degrees of the freezing point. Which does unfortunately mean that it's been very icy. Yes, because, because the little bit of snow that we did get melts. And freezes a little bit. and melts and freezes and yeah. melts and freezes over and over again as the temperature goes just above and below freezing all the time. And it makes for icy roads, but still like dry yards. Yeah. <laughs> it's weird. Welcome to Canada. Yeah, it is just what we're going to have to deal with this particular year. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, I can't do anything about it. So. Yeah. And I, I realize I say that we're not going to have a, a white Christmas Despite the fact that when this episode drops, Christmas will have happened because we're recording this one a little bit early. For Christmas reasons. Because our normal recording time is going to be filled up with Christmas stuff. Yeah. Uh, But Happy New Year, because that's coming up. Oh, yeah. That's coming up, too. Yeah. That'll probably be brown as well. (laughs) Indeed. (laughs) But it's all good because it's New Year's. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. There will be parties. There will be drinks and celebrations and friends and hugs and kisses and joys, and it'll be great. Yeah, and hopefully 2024 will be at least marginally better than 2023 was. It's already looking up. That is true, yeah. But as we look to the future, we also go to the future in our novel, but not before a quick recap of our previous chapter in which we meet our trio of teen witch detectives. Yes. Uh, Primarily Mallory, but also her two best friends as they try to start a detective agency at the very party where a murder has just taken place. That feels the murder. And they go and look for a mystery to solve and, well, find one very quickly because very quickly. of the murder that just happened. <laughs> and then they set about trying to solve it, and that leads us into Chapter 3 of The Undetectables by Courtney Smith. Friends, the Undetectables did not solve Theodore's murder. (laughs) That's basically how the third chapter opens. Yeah. Right? With, uh, if a narrator were narrating this, this is what that narrator would say. And Ron Howard was playing in my head. Was Ron Howard playing in your head? (laughs) Not really. Because he was absolutely playing in my head. Ron Howard is not the uh, voice in my head when I'm reading generally. (laughs) No, but whenever anyone says narrator voice, it is immediately Ron Howard. Because of Arrested Development. Because of Arrested Development. He has a very good narrator voice. (laughs) Right? Yeah, we are now six years in the future. Well, we are now six years from our first two chapters, which I believe is what we consider the present. Yeah, technically we're like five and change because uh, we are pre-Samhain. By like nine days or something like that? Yeah, and and Mallory is now 20 years old. Yes. 
there has not been a, a, <laughs> a successful murder solve. The undetectables are not a detective agency at this time. No. Things have not gone to plan. <laughs> not even a little bit. No. Mallory, unfortunately, was diagnosed with fibromyalgia. Yes. Which leaves her exhausted and in pain most of the time. Yes. Cornelia became freakishly obsessed with entomology to the point that she left high school over it and like tunnel visioned herself into that field. Diana got swept up into the world of prop making and wants to work in television. Mm -hmm. Girl after my own heart. And yeah, here we are six years later. All these girls are all now in their early 20s at least. And their life paths are all forking apart. And poor Mallory can't move on. There's also another character who can't move on. <laughs> yeah, yes. She is stuck with Theodore. Yeah, Theodore is now her best friend. He is her ghost gay best friend. P- kinda, yeah. Yeah. He's like always <laughs> around. He's And apparently he still has his job, despite being dead. <laughs> I don't know how that works. I kind of hope they explain it a little bit. Well, the Ghoul Council deals with supernatural phenomenon, and he's an expert in, like, spectral manifestations. And now he is a spectral manifestation. So th- I guess they just retained him, and he's continuing to work with the Ghoul Council in the same capacity, just dead. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> like, it's it's weird. And he gets very dramatic. He is 100% her gay best friend. He, well, as she puts it, he has two uh, modes, dramatic and overly dramatic. <laughs> He is like an over stereotypical gay best friend. Yes. <laughs> yes. He don't is. don't misunderstand. He is delightful, and I love him very much, and I look forward to him being in this book. But in this first interaction that we see between them, he is being over dramatic, and she is not having much of it. No, because she is wallowing. Oh, thousand percent. Yeah, Mallory has not had a good couple of years, and rather than try to do anything about it she has basically from the sounds of it been spinning her wheels for a couple years yeah she feels really really sorry for herself yeah sorry for herself (laughs) stuck where she is she is wallowing like edging into despair and she's strangely resentful of the fact that her friends have moved on with their lives rather than just wallow with her Kind of. Like, yeah. it's humans are complicated. She's proud that they've gone on to accomplish things and pursue their lives, but she's also resentful of that fact because they've been able to do it and she hasn't. It's a, it's a fun mix of envy and resentment and, pride. Se- and self-pity and, and definitely pride. Self, it's definitely self-pity. <sighs> humans are complicated creatures. You're right. Yeah. Now, I did a little searching a little bit of a cursory look into our author a little bit to see if this is Courtney Smith writing what they know. And yes, it is. Kinda. From what I've managed to turn up, I don't know that Courtney Smith has fibromyalgia, but they are chronically ill. And so they wanted to write a character who kind of reflected that life experience because they felt that they didn't see people with chronic illness as protagonists in stories very often. Fair enough. So this was this was a very deliberate choice. Now, again, I don't know 100% if Courtney Smith has or does not have fibromyalgia specifically, but that was the choice made for Mallory here. Yeah. Um, I also did a little bit of looking into fibromyalgia. Okay. And I can tell you pretty reasonably that uh, Mallory has spent the last couple of years not helping herself. It doesn't sound like it. No. There is no cure for fibromyalgia. Correct. But there are treatments. There is ways to mitigate the pain and to help yourself learn to function in spite of the illness and not let it kind of dominate your life. And from what we read in this chapter, that has not been Mallory's case. Okay. So either Mallory has not been presented with that option. Which is possible. And I want to touch on that. Yeah. Which is possible. Or they are like actively rejecting it for some reason. Because she's feeling sorry for herself. Yes, I when suppose. You're, when you're depressed and in despair, sometimes it's hard to help yourself. That's very true. And I'm, I'm sympathetic, but at some point you also have to go, but you're also not doing anything to help yourself. And I can't help but wonder if that's one of the reasons why Diana and Cornelia haven't been talking to her as much. Because it's hard to be around someone who's just wallowing. I know. I get, yeah. 
even it's, if you it's true. even if you love them to pieces, it's hard to be with people you love when they're not doing anything to help themselves. Right. And there's only so much you can do to help someone. Yeah. Right. You can care for someone to a point. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I get it. You can I be get it. you can be sympathetic and still be like you you got to actually get up off the couch, girl. Like <laughs> reading reading this chapter was really interesting because it provided both like an inside look mm -hmm. and gave me the opportunity to come in with an outside eye. Yeah. And again, we're we're not people who live with chronic illness. No. And so But we know people who do. Or certainly haven't up until this point. There, yes. There's always the possibility that it might happen. Yeah, knock wood. But it does seem like Mallory is letting the fibromyalgia dominate her life yep. at this point. Now, you did bring up the fact that it's possible she hasn't been presented with positive options that she could look into. Right. That's a possibility because she's coming from this magical world. She had to, by her own admission, go and seek out a non-magical doctor to give her this diagnosis and tell her what was wrong. Correct. If she's not regularly dealing with the mundane medical apparatus, it's possible she hasn't been given good options. Right. She so, doesn't know that her life could be a lot closer to normal. Than it currently is. Than it currently is. Because um, we don't know how the occulture deals with non-magical ailments. Like they might have lycanthropy down pat. <laughs> it's true. But fibromyalgia, might. they're just like, I don't even know how to spell that. Like, <laughs> Well, yeah. Like they don't totally fathom electricity. <laughs> yeah. Right. So something as complicated as a condition like fibromyalgia might just be way overheads. Yeah. Right? Like way, way, way overheads. Yeah. So like this could be a, a cultural problem too for her. Yeah, maybe. So I don't want to put it entirely on her shoulders. We don't know all the circumstances, but girl needs to get out. She really does. Yeah. And she kind of rejects the call here because- <laughs> Kind of. The real kind of meat of this chapter is she receives a letter, which Theodore hands to her, uh, having gotten her mail. And the letter basically says, hey, FYI, um, there's been a murder. I've reached out to a bunch of local authorities and other more reputable organizations. Nobody seems to be willing to help. You're kind of my last resort. Are you interested in the case? Give me a call. And include some of the details of, of the murder, which is another murder. Yeah. Which Theodore immediately is like, oh, it's around Samhain. It might be linked to my murder. We could go back to trying to solve my murder. And Mallory's knee-jerk reaction is, Theodore's putting me on. He's just feeling sorry for me. He's trying to cheer me up. That's why he's like, you should get a hold of the girls, get the gang back together, go try to solve this case and try to solve my case. She kind of snaps at him here. Yeah. In her in her despair. She's, she's kind of, I feel like she's hit a really low point today. Kind of like rock bottom. Kind of. Yeah. It's. Yeah, she, certainly what it looks like. She anyway. certainly feels like she's hit rock bottom when Theodore storms out and she wakes up from her little nap feeling a little better and realizes, oh, I said some really mean and awful things to him. Yeah. And if he never talks to me again, that's on me. She genuinely doesn't want to bother her friends yep. because that's how little she thinks of herself. She snaps at Theodore because everything hurts today and he's trying really hard and to... it's just getting on her nerves. Yeah. Right? And her nerves are already in pain and it's just worse. So she just makes yeah. everything awful. <laughs> yeah. Not like... She puts her foot in it. Act... She really does. In her despair, she puts her yeah, foot in again, it. Yeah, again, no malice, but she does not handle it well. <laughs> now, the good news is the call then calls her. Oh, well, she gets a call, but not from this person. Not from this person, but from her friends. Yes. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I misunderstood what you were saying. Well, I suspect that her friends call her related to what's going on. So, but I don't know if it is. Maybe. Cornelia calls and the phone call is a little broken up. It could be bad cell reception. It could be the fact that Theodore is like an electrically charged ghost <laughs> and may have damaged her electronics. Uh. But either way, she only gets part of the message. And from what she can piece together, Cornelia is saying, Diana has been murdered. Yes. Come to my house. Yes. And I am happy for this. <laughs> I'm not happy that Diana's been murdered, which, by the way, I don't think she has. Honestly, I give it 50-50 odds. I don't even think 50-50. Diana's hitting up her ex-girlfriends at the back of the book. Yeah, but she could be doing it as a ghost. Eh, she doesn't look like a picture of a ghost in the little drawing on the bottom. No, because if they give away a murder right off the top, that spoils everything. I don't think Diana's been murdered. I think that Cornelia's message was adequately broken up, that that's the impression that she's been given. Yes. But that is an impression that's enough to get Mallory off the couch. Oh, I hope so. If one of her best friends has been murdered in her mind, that's going to give her the push she needs to actually get her butt off the couch 
to get out the door. And make the great trek up the street to her friend's old house. Yes. So I think that that's the push she needed, honestly. Yeah. Now, it could be innocent. It could be Cornelia's messing with her just to get her out of the house. Maybe? It could be that Theodore immediately went to find Cornelia and was like, we need to do something to get Mallory off the couch. Or that would explain the phone static, actually, if it was on the other end. That's true, actually. I hadn't even considered that. That was right off the top of my head right now, because my initial thought was that there's maybe been a second murder, because we know that there's there's a serial killer afoot. Yes. And that, like, suddenly there's all these murders that need solved, and they're eventually going to link them together. But it could just be that Theodore went over and was <laughs> like, you need to call Mallory and get her over. <laughs> we need to intervene. There needs to be an intervention. <laughs> That does sound like something Theodore would do. It absolutely sounds like something. Now that I've said that out loud, I give it like 75% chance that that's what's going on. <laughs> the Theodore went to Cornelia, yep. told her about the letter, and then, okay, let's phone Mallory and get her in here. Yeah. I like it. I hope that's what happens, actually. There you go. So I have a one question about this mysterious letter writer. Sure. My feeling is that it might be someone who they interacted with at the party six years ago. I mean, maybe. Who thus had their card. Possibly. So the letter is signed J. Gabbett. I don't know that we know a J. Gabbett at this time. No, it not at this time. certainly wasn't a name that rung uh, a bell. I am very confident that our victim's name is going to be bandied about quite a bit. A Mr. Edward Custer with yeah. a K. Yeah, because I think that's our that's clearly our next murder. Yeah, we, we don't have any details about Mr. Custer at this time. No, we just have his name and some details about his death. <laughs> yeah. And we also don't know much about the person who's trying to hire them to look into it either. It's true. So that's my question. Is our letter writer grasping at straws to find a detective agency run by teenagers several years ago who are no longer a thing? Well, he it almost explicitly says that he contacted them as kind of a last resort. Right. But it, does he know who he's contacting? He... Do they know who they are contacting or are they just like, I think they're grasping, grasping at, straws. at straws and like this is a letter that went to lots of different possibilities. I don't think this is a letter that went to lots of different possibilities. I think this is a last resort letter being sent specifically to them. Oh, I think okay. there were previous letters to more reputable organizations prior to this. That tracks too, actually. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, but I guess maybe we'll find out more as we move into chapter four of our novel, uh, which you'll want to read up in time for next week. In the meantime, of course, you can give us a little rating and a review on your podcatcher of choice. We always appreciate those. It'd yeah. be a lovely Christmas present. Definitely helps. Out, well, a belated one at this point. Yeah, doesn't matter. But it does help us out. Uh, you can also reach us via social media. Absolutely. We are on X, Instagram, Facebook, uh, Goodreads, and Blue Sky. We are at the read along on most of those. You can find us that way. Yeah, you can also send us an email. Yes, we would love to get one of those. We are the read along at gmail.com. And with that said, as always, we love you very much and we'll see you next time. Happy Christmas and Merry New Year, everybody. Thank you for joining us on The Read Along with your hosts, Anita and Scott Bourgeois. All Read Along music is by Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com. Cover art is by Aaron Beaver. Be sure to join us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at The Read Along, and check out our group on Goodreads.com. Mm-hmm.